something about uh, the so-called um, supermax prison, where they keep um, where they keep a prison uh, prisoners who are deemed the worst of the worst. And these people are uh, they are the most dangerous people. And usually they keep them in this um, solitary confinement. You are alone and there's nobody else. You are in a very small cell with no windows. And your bed is made of either metal or, or concrete. And um, sometimes uh, the building uh, and the walls, including the plumbing, are some proof so that you may not be able to communicate with the person next to you. And in these supermax prisons, they keep you there alone with no human contact for 23 hours. You are not allowed to talk to anyone. You are alone without any human contact for 23 hours. And they allow you one hour a day to go out and exercise. And you are exercising by yourself. You are not allowed to exercise with other people. You are just there. You are alone pretty much 24 hours a day, for the whole day. You're not allowed to have human contact. And um, in one of the prisons in, in California, you are, they keep you there at the average, they keep people there at the average of eight years. Eight years. You stay there, no human contact every day, 23 hours alone, inside, indoors, and one hour outside, you exercise by yourself. And, and sometimes people stay in these prison, uh, prisons for decades. And and um, I was reading about the the effects, the psychological uh, effects um, of this situation uh, on the prisoners, and I realized that they do have problems. Some people cannot handle it. Some people cannot. Handle it. Some some maybe are strong. They can deal with it. Some people cannot handle it, uh, and they have they develop symptoms uh, like uh, PS. PTSD, that's what I'm PTSD. Alright. And, and and they, they have um that anger issues, they have anxiety issues, they have depression, and some of them actually they have hallucination, some of them are suicidal, some of them they do things to harm and hurt themselves. Alright, and um so much stress. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, I don't understand the reason, I don't know why they have these symptoms. But I think these conditions do break somebody's spirit. They break your spirit. I, I imagine uh, being, uh, you know, not having a human contact for a long time. It makes you feel less of a human. To just be there by yourself all the time. It makes you feel maybe less of a human. And I'm thinking about that and and the reason I mention this to you is because, is because today in our church we are celebrating friendship. All right. And we decided to do this once a month. Every month we invite friends. Once a month we celebrate friendship. And I'm thinking, it's a gift. Friendship is a gift. And the title of my talk this morning is A Friend Who Sticks Closer. That's the title of my talk this morning. And I will not look at that clock. The friend, a friend who sticks closer. And the best place for me to start talking about friendship is back in creation. The Bible says that God created everything we know. Everything we can see. And even the things we cannot see. In six days. The Bible says that uh, the earth was formless and dark and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So there was nothing. There was nothing but chaos and darkness and water. And the Bible says that God spoke and He says, let there be light and there was light. And the Bible says that God saw that the light was good. It was day one. And that is Monday, and that is Sunday. On Monday, the Bible says that God created the sky. And the Bible says that He saw it was good. And that was day two. It was good. And the Bible says that on uh, Tuesday, God created dry land. He created um, also the seas, 
the oceans and the plants. And the Bible says that he saw all these things and they were very good. And the Bible says that God made the sun, moon and stars. And they were so good. The Bible keeps saying every time, every time God made something, the Bible says that it was good. And the next day God made fish and birds. The Bible says that it was good. And the next day God made land on uh, animals. And he also made um, Adam. He made all the bugs and all the insects. And the Bible says that he commanded Adam, he said to him, I want you to rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over every living thing, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Over all the earth, I want you to be the ruler. So Adam was to be a king, he was to be a prince. He was given everything it seemed, everything that he could wish for, everything that he needed. It seemed that God gave him all these things. And God assigned him. He assigned him to name all the animals. And the Bible says that they came to him. We get the impression they came to him in pairs, in, in partners. It was the lion and the lioness, the tiger and the tigress. It was um, a goose and a gander. It was uh, a ram and a ewe. It was a bull and a sow. It was all these animals. They came to him two by two. And the Bible says that to Adam there was no companion. He was alone. There was no com uh, companion for him. He had nobody to talk and laugh with. There was nobody who could speak the same language. He was uh, there alone and there was nobody to share life with him. And the Bible for the first time says that, and God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And I, I know that a lot of people, they, they hear this verse in the context of marriage. But I'm saying, what I get from it is that we are social beings. God made us social creatures. I mean, it's, it's, it's bigger than just marriage. We need friends, we need family, we need love, we need laughter, we need family, we need friends. We are social creatures. We are social beings. This morning we're celebrating friendship. And I'm thinking, God says it was not good for a man to be alone. We need each other. No, nobody can, can, can put it better than um, John Donne when he said, um, no man is an island. No man is an island. And I happen to just agree with that. No man is an island. I say to you, that's how God made us. God made us like that. We are not individual islands. In fact, uh, John Donne says that no man is an island. But every man is part of the continent. And I'm saying no. Uh, because continents are more apart from each other. And I'm saying that no man is an island. Every man is part of a village. In a village, everybody is dependent on each other. Village are closer. Continents are more apart. We need each other. We, we, we are not islands. We are villages. Every, uh, everyone, every man is uh, a village. According to me. I'm thinking, that's why we have to sometimes just pause and celebrate friendship. Just pause once in a while and just tell somebody, hey, thank you for being my friend. I appreciate it. Just pause and, and just appreciate life. And pause and, and appreciate the people around you. Because I believe that friendship is a gift from God. I believe that it is one of the best gifts that God has ever given to us. God gave us the best gifts. But friendship is right there. Right there among the top gifts. That, and I've, I said, I've said that uh, to my friends so many times. And we must know a lot of stories, a lot of beautiful friendship stories that inspire our hearts. We, we may have heard of people uh, who risked their lives to save their Jewish uh, friends during the Holocaust. We, we know of people, we know of soldiers who, who risked their lives and went to the no man, uh, no man land. 
to rescue a, a wounded uh, friend. We know somebody who gave a kidney or a lung to a dear friend. We know somebody who, even people who shave their heads to show solidarity with their, somebody who's, who's suffering with cancer. Friendship is very important. And this morning, I want to tell you a story. And it's a friendship story. And to me, it's the best Bible story about friendship. And I, I know you could go from the book of Genesis to Revelation. There is no story like this. It's, the, it's classic. It's a story of the friendship of David and Jonathan. There is no other friendship story in the Bible that matches that story. And for one thing, like any classics, this story was not meant to be. Uh, Jonathan lived in a city in Jerusalem. He was a city boy. He lived in the biggest, in the most, in the best city in Israel at that time. In fact, Jerusalem was called the city of the great king. It was called the city of God. But David, on the other hand, he, lived, he was a country boy. He lived in the smallest town of Bethlehem. The smallest in all the towns of Judah. The other thing is that Jonathan was uh, a crown prince. He was to be a king after his father, Saul. He was a crown prince. But the only thing we know about uh, David's father was, his name was Jesse, and he had seven sons. We don't really know much about him. But we know that Jonathan's father was a king, and Jonathan himself was to be a king. The other thing is that uh, Jonathan, according to the Bible, was the firstborn son, but David was the lastborn. The other thing is that every time, every time Saul went to war, he would took all of his sons. He would, he, he take, uh, he would take up Jonathan with him because he was training him and grooming him to be a warrior king. So every time Saul went to war, he would go with his sons to train them, to tra especially to train Jonathan, so that when he takes over, he succeeds him, he will be a king who can fight wars. But the Bible says that David was a shepherd boy, and the only weapons he knew was a sling and a stick. And I must add, he could also sing and pray. This was not a friendship that was to be. This friendship was not meant to be. But the Bible says that uh, Jonathan and David met for the first time in a battle. In a battle. And David goes there. He goes there not to fight. He is there to bring food for his brother. And Jonathan is also there not to bring food. But he is a warrior prince. He is there to fight in the battle. So David is there and he hears uh, you know, this uh, man called Goliath challenging and taunting um, the armies of Israel saying, send us one man, give us one man who can come and fight with us, fight with me, and then if you win, then you win. All right. And, 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 and David listens to this and, and he says something that sounded so naive and so childish of him. He asked the people, he says, who is this Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And people were like, you know, because he was a young boy. And he, he, he sounded so naive. You know, and, and he asked this by saying, I want to fight him. I want to fight this guy. You know, and somebody said, you know, talk to the king. And the king says, you are just a small boy. You know, this man has been in the military all his life, from his youth. He has more experience than you. All right, you cannot fight him. And, and, and David says, uh, uh, the God who delivered me from the paw of the lion and of the bear. You remember the Bible, the Bible says that um, once, uh, the Bible doesn't remember the story, but one time there was a lion who came to attack um, David's flock. And the Bible says that David did not run away. Another day, a bear came and David fought in Jesus' name and he was successful. So he referenced that. 
Now, on top of that, uh, after talking to Saul for a while, um, Saul says, okay, you know, just go and do it, but at least have my armor, all right, have my sword, have my helmet, and, and, and get ready for war. And, and David says, I don't need all this. And, and everybody is thinking, this, this boy is crazy. What's wrong with him? You know, you are fighting somebody who's almost 10 feet, almost 10 feet tall, and you are just a small boy. You tell us you don't even need any armor. All right, he says, I don't need these people to relax. And he goes down to a little brook. The Bible says that he picks five little stones. And the Bible says that uh, as, as Goliath was just mocking and, and, and taunting the people, uh, David says to him, you come to me, uh, you come to fight me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin. All right, I come to you in the name of the Lord, uh, the name of the God of Israel, whom you taunting. All right, and the Bible says that uh, Goliath is angry, he's, he's just fuming. He uh, foolishly takes off his helmet, and that, that's when David slings at him. And the Bible says that he was hit by just one stone, and the giant did come tumbling down. And now everybody's watching this. Everybody is there. Uh, Saul is there, and Jonathan is there watching this. And everybody starts shouting and singing and praising the Lord. Everybody's happy. Now, David has suddenly become a hero. Everybody's praising God, praising God for David. And, and, and the Bible says that now because of that, uh, he had an opportunity, David, just to talk to the king for the first time. And he is introduced to the king, and the king is asking, whose son are you, where you come from, his background. And the whole time the Bible says that Jonathan is just watching, and he is looking at this young, uh, at this young man with so much admiration. He's impressed. And the Bible says in the scripture that we just read, and Jonathan, um, so he, the Bible says his soul was knit to the soul of David. Another Bible says that David and Jonathan were bound together. They, they, in fact, another version says that there was a, an instant connection between David and Jonathan. There, there was, there was, they were tied. They just became tied. There was, there was something that would, that was drawing uh, them to each other. All right, and, and, and I'm thinking, this is, this is so beautiful, this is, this is great, you know, because we, you don't hear uh, the Bible talks like that about, you know, another person, when you talk about your soul being knit, you want to be knit with Jesus, not with another person, but the Bible says that uh, uh, the soul of, day of Jonathan was so connected, so knit, so tied to the soul of David, now I'm thinking, I'm thinking, obviously, at least, especially from David's side, this was not the kind of relationship he had with his siblings. This, this was not the relationship he had with his, this was a special relationship. He did not have this relationship with his siblings. And I, I know that because you, you, you listen to the tone of his brother when he talks to you. He puts him down. There was no special relationship. Uh, there, there was that sibling relationship, but, but I, I know that they, they, there was no, um, there was, they were not really, really, really tight. Now, I thought about um, the, 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 um, the quotation I just read um, a few days ago um, from a Chinese philosopher, and we all know this quotation. It says that um, friends are the siblings that God never gave us. Friends are the siblings that God never gave us. And you know that. No, you, you know that you sometimes you have siblings, and it's not, I'm not talking about relationships where you don't get along with your siblings. I'm, I'm not talking about people who don't get along as family. I'm talking about a family, a, a relationship in a family where you actually get along with your siblings. But you feel like a friend, a friend can, 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 can get you more. You, you, you feel like um, with a friend you can sit down and, and have a conversation for a long time without saying a single word. You, you feel like they, they can get you. You feel like they, 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 you, you connect with them more. All right, another, another uh, philosopher says that um, one loyal friend is worth 10,000 relatives because friends are that important. Sometimes relatives and siblings are good 
But friends can really, they can really get you. All right, and I want you to remember that we're talking about um, friendship here. All right, now the other thing I want to mention is, um, is because of uh, David's heroic um, act. He had people who loved him. Uh, chapter, uh, uh, in chapter 18, verse 13, uh, the Bible says that uh, everybody in Judah and uh, in Israel, they fell in love with David. Everybody just loved him. To the point that somebody composed a song about him. Somebody come. I don't know the whole song, but I know just one portion. It says that Saul killed thousands, but David killed ten thousands. And, and the Bible says because of that, because of that, Saul was not very happy. He was very, very much unhappy with David. He actually started hating him. He started wanting to kill him. He started, in fact, twice, twice, twice. David had to run away when uh, Saul threw a javelin, uh, javelin at him, wanting to pin him against the wall. Twice. The king wanted to kill David. All right. But he was not successful. Now, he came with a plan. He came up with a very good plan. He came up with a plan, according to him, that was supposed to work. It was the best plan. And it's in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. I want us to read um, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. That was the plan. It says, Now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. So, so, so Saul, he, he comes to Jonathan, David's best friend. He says, I want you to kill him. That, that was the plan. Jonathan was to kill David. That was the great plan. That was the grand plan. And it was supposed to work. Because there was no way uh, for David to be run away, running away from his best friend. He was to kill him when he was not expecting. Alright, he was to just you know, kill him. <laughs> but the Bible says that Jonathan refused. Jonathan refused this. And what he did, he went and told David. David, and every time he heard this, every time he heard that uh, uh, the king was planning something against David, he would go and just tell David that my father wants to kill you. All right. But it, it, it came to a point where David was not really safe in Jerusalem. He had to move as far away as possible from the king. And, and, and the best part of the story is now in chapter 20. The best part of the story is in chapter 20. I'm telling a story. Um, something Jesus loved um, doing. Storytelling. Best story, uh, the best part is um, in chapter 20. And um, I'm reading from verse 13. Um, and uh, up to 17. I mean, I mean, we didn't pause. It says, um, If it please my father to do harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan. Uh, and more also, if I do not make it known to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And now, listen to this part. And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. I'm just going to pause there. I'm just going to pause there. David, uh, Jonathan says to David, May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. You know what he's doing here? He's actually yielding the crown. He's giving it to David. He's passing the crown. He's giving it up to David. He says that, I know you will be king after me, uh, after my father. I know I am supposed to be king. I am the heir to the crown, to the throne. I am supposed to be king. I am a crown prince, but I know that you will be the king, not me. And I'm fine with it. I'm perfectly fine with it. I know I'm supposed to be king, but I'm giving to... Uh, Jonathan is giving the crown. He's yielding his right 
to his friend. I, I, I cannot think of any selflessness like that. When, when somebody was to be a king, and they decide they don't want to be a king because they want their friend to be a king. There is no story I know of that is similar to this one. So Jonathan is saying that, I I'll, I'll, I'll pray that may the Lord bless you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not angry. I'm happy actually. I pray that the Lord may bless you as he's been blessing my father. I'm giving you my crown. To me, that is the most beautiful thing ever. That is the most beautiful thing ever. But also the Bible says that uh, in, in the following verses, we don't have time. In the following verses, the Bible says that Jonathan and David made a covenant. The only thing that uh, Jonathan asked from David, he says that when you become king, if I'm still alive, I want us to remain friends. I want you to do me no harm. I still want us to be tight. I want you to be my friend. If I'm still alive, when you ascend to the throne, that's all I want. And he says that if I'm not allowed, I want you to show kindness to my children. That's the only thing I ask. I want you to show kindness to my house. If I'm, not, if I'm alive, please, I want to remain tight with you. There's no friendship like that. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. <clears throat> And the Bible says, after this conversation, Jonathan goes home and he talks to the father. And um, I want us to read um, chapter 20, verse 30. Chapter 20, verse 30. Then Saul's anger burned against Jonathan. He said to him, uh, you son of a uh, perverse, oh uh, no! You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to uh, your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long, verse thirty-one. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he must surely die. Now I want to skip all the verses and go to verse 33. He says, Then Saul heard um, his spear uh, to strike him down. So Jonathan knew his father had decided to put uh, David to death. So he talked to his father, he talks to his father, and his father says, How foolish are you? How foolish are you? Why are you acting against your own interests? Don't you know that if this man leaves, then you cannot be king, and if you cannot be king, then our family, even the whole kingdom, cannot be established. David has to die for you to be established. David must die. Why are you acting against your own personal interest? This is not the best thing you can do. You must bring him to me, and I must kill him so that you may succeed me as my son and king. Why are you so foolish? And, and the Bible says that uh, Jonathan asked him, but what did he do wrong? And then, uh, of course, like, Saul just lost it. He just got angry. He just threw his spear on him, wanted to kill him. And then that's when the, the, the Bible says that Jonathan, Jonathan just left. And the following verses, it says, Jonathan met with David. And now this time they knew that they are meeting for the last time. That's what the Bible says. They are meeting for the last time and they are talking. And the Bible says that they both began to weep. And the Bible says that uh, David wept more than Jonathan. He cried. They were saying goodbye to each other. They knew they were going to see each other because now Saul was angry. Saul wanted to just kill. He was going to hunt him to death. He was going to look for him and kill him. So they cried. And they never saw each other after that. For many years. In fact, Jonathan died without ever seeing David again. He died and the news came to David and the Bible says that he tore his clothes. He cried, he wept, he fasted. He even composed a song. Why? He wept. And the Bible says that when David became king, when David became king, we are told of a story. This is 
the last part of the story. We are told that Jonathan, before he died, he had a son named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was uh, Jonathan's son. When the news came that Jonathan had died, uh, his nurse, uh, Jonathan's uh, 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 Mephibosheth's nurse, he, uh, he, she wanted to run away and flee and just to go to a safe place for the child to grow. But as she was carrying him on his back, uh, the baby fell and she broke both his legs and he was crippled. So Mephibosheth was crippled. All right. And the Bible says that um, now in, in chapter 9, I want us to quickly read them. Um, uh, I was not going to say, I, I was going to say, I'm almost done, but I was told not to say that. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, with you, the, the last portion of this story, and then I'm going to say a few things and hopefully sit down. All right. Uh, the last portion of the story is uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I want us to read uh, verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Is there anyone in Saul's family who's still alive? Because I want to show kindness. And it says, for Jonathan's sake. And now the Bible says that Mephibosheth was, was brought before David. And verse, uh, uh, if you read verse 7, uh, verse 7 says that, uh, this is now David talking to Mephibosheth. He says that, do not fear, for I will show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore you to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. And you shall eat at my table regularly. Alright, now, this is the, the last part of the story. It, it says, so, uh, Mephibosheth is brought, and, and David says that, I want to restore to you everything that your grandfather Saul uh, owned. I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you all the land, all the property, everything that your grandfather owned. All right. But the, that's not the best part. The best part is this, is that he said, I want you to come and eat at my table for as long as you shall live every day. Now I don't. I think you, you don't. You understand this? Back in the day, there were no wheelchairs. All right, there were no wheelchairs. Meaning, Mephibosheth had to be actually carried to the palace. All right, and every day, every time the king was having lunch or breakfast or dinner, uh, somebody would carry Mephibosheth and and, and sit and, and David would not eat until. Mephibosheth is brought. He will just wait for him. All right. Every day for the rest of his life until he died. All right. Every day he comes and the king is waiting. The king is not touch anything until he comes in. And people are carrying and they put him there. And then, then the king will start to eat. And this happened, the Bible says that, for the rest of his life. And I'm saying, what an honor. What a privilege. And maybe in your mind, when, when I say what an honor, obviously you are thinking, what an honor to Mephibosheth. No, it was an honor to David. It was an honor to David to sit down and feast with Mephibosheth. You know why? Because in his mind, David knew that Jonathan was the rightful heir to the throne. Jonathan and Jonathan alone had a right to be king. But now David is king. And he feels honored that he is king. And now this is... Mephibosheth, this is Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan's son. And now, every time he looks at Mephibosheth, he sees Jonathan, his best friend. His best friend. And uh, it's an honor to David. Because David was not supposed to be king. But Mephibosheth was to be king. But now Mephibosheth is just sitting there and eating and doing nothing else. Mephibosheth was to be king, not David. And I'm saying, for the rest of his life, every time um, David looked at Mephibosheth, 
He just remember, he remembered John. And he was great. But he was there. And I'm saying to you, the key word I want you to not forget today is the word selfless. Selflessness. Selflessness. The Bible says in Corinthians uh, 13, if you read verse 4 and 5, it says that uh, in the King James, it, says, it used the big word, it says, Love wanteth not. I mean, the word there is a wanted. It says, love does not push itself forward. It does not push itself forward. It says, when you love somebody, you put them first. And you are behind them. You put their interests before you. And, 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 and we learn from the story of David and Jonathan that uh, when you love somebody, you don't see them as competition. Jonathan did not look at David and see competition. He saw his best friend and he loved him. And he put his interests first. He put him first. He had this self-forgetfulness. Alright, and I'm saying that is beautiful. That is love. And people think that the opposite of love is hatred. And I'm saying no. The opposite of love is selfishness. When you think more of yourself and less of the other person. And that relationship cannot work. If you think too much of yourself and less of the other person, that relationship will not work. Be it marriage, be it friendship, any kind of relationship. If it's more about you and less of the other person, there is no success. And in the relationship of Jonathan and David, we see somebody who put David first and forgot about himself, and he thought less of himself. He even thought less of the crown, and he gave it to his friend freely, and he prayed for him, for blessings upon him. Now, there are many definitions of friendship we can think of. There are many. But I cannot think of this one, this is the last person I'm going to read, I cannot think of this one, uh, of any definition that is better than that, what Christ gave. The only definition I can think of that kind of resonates with me is in um, John chapter 15, verse 13. It's the last verse I'm reading. It's the last verse I'm reading. John chapter 15, verse 13. It says, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friend. Greater love has no man than this. Now, I want you to understand this. This is Jesus now telling us what love is. All right. He says that greater love has no man than this, than a, there's no best friend you can have than a friend who is willing to inconvenience themselves. A person who's willing to go out of this of his way. A person who does not mind being inconvenienced. And I, I'm putting it mildly on this. I'm being modest right now. But the, the key point in the verse is self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. And who would know that better than Christ? Who would know that better than Christ? Who would know that better than Christ? Who would know this better than Christ? And the Bible says that Christ himself, Christ himself, did exactly this. The Bible says that he left the throne up in glory, the, thro the throne, the praises of angels, thousands upon thousands of angels. He is now, he was sitting as the king of the universe. The Bible says that he left the throne for a manger. He was born as a helpless babe in a manger who could not feed himself, who could not take care of himself, who could not do anything for himself. Being the king of the universe to becoming almost nothing, a baby, a helpless baby. He left the crown for the cross. Jesus Christ, the king, you know, you know the song that says, he's got the whole world in his hand, he's got the whole world in his hand, the Bible says, the other part says that, he's got the wind and the rain in his hand, he's got the wind and the rain in his hand. No, Jesus Christ, who got the, the, who's got the wind and the rain in his hand, he also became a carpenter, who was broke, who had no money, who had to sell carpentry for him to have food, who suffered. The Bible says that he left all the praises, all the beautiful things that would happen to become, the Bible says that, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. That's what the Bible calls him in Isaiah. A man of sorrows. From there to here. All right. And, and, and the Bible says that he went all the way to the cross. And last time I preached, I said the cross was the worst way for somebody to die. 
It was the it was the, there was shame in it. It was disgraceful to just hang him there. And as Jesus was hanging between the two thieves, as he is there, he is hanging there, and, and, and I want you to think that it should have been you. It should have been you. It should have been me. It should have been me. And I'm saying selflessness. He put us first. He put us first. He, he had this self-forgetfulness. He forgot about everything. And he put us first. And he hung in there and did not just walk away from us. He stayed there. And he gives, he gives us a definition. The, what better love than this done? You lay down your life for a friend. Now, I want to pause and as I close, I want to say this. Jesus put you first. When he came, when he left the streets of gold to walk these dusty streets of house, when he was hungry and thirsty, when he suffered the way he suffered, it was only because he put you first. Like Jonathan put his friend first. And this morning I want to say this. I want to say this. Jesus wants to be a friend. I know he's your friend. And he's a different kind of friend. He's the kind you can count on. When there's nobody else, when there's nobody else to count on, you can count on Jesus. When you are lonely, Jesus can keep you company. When you are distressed and confused, Jesus is uh, a wonderful, the wonderful counselor. He is also the Prince of Peace. He gives you that. When, 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 when you are sick, Jesus is the great physician. Jesus is everything you can ever ask for. He is that friend who sticks closer than a brother. The only kind of friend you need. Because you know what? Sometimes with these good friends, they mean well, but they cannot always be there for you. I, I, I had a friend back home, I was in university, and um, she was back home, and she was very sick with her stomach, I don't know what was the problem, she was actually sick, very sick, doctors did not know what was wrong with her, and, um, and um, so I came for vacation time to see her, and, um, and then she said, wow, I suddenly feel better that you're around, I feel like I have more strength, I made a promise, I said, you know what, I will be coming here every day for as long as I'm, I'm in town. I'll be coming to see you. I didn't. I got busy. I skipped a day, and I think she got worse. She actually died. She died. And I thought to myself, I don't know if I would have made a difference by just being there. You know, she died. And I had promised her that I'll be there for her. But I couldn't. Sometimes your friends want to be there for you, but they can't. It happens. And Jesus is that kind of friend who is guaranteed to be there for you. Guaranteed to be there for you. He's not going to promise to be there and not be there. And the Bible says that I will always be with you and always is forever. It always is not occasionally. Always is not sometimes. Always is not every now and then. Always not like every now and then. Once in a blue moon. Jesus says always be with you until the end of the age. I will be with you. It's guaranteed. Never leave you, nor forsake you. He is that friend. He is that friend you need. And I'm saying as we celebrate friendship this morning, let us think about that one friend who sticks closer than the brother. Jesus Christ. The only friend we can have.